think we'll go ahead and get formally started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to those in Berlin. Uh, my name's Jay Morgan. Uh, I'm a policy manager at the Representative of German Industry and Trade. Uh, we represent the two largest German industry associations uh, in Washington, uh, the EDI, which is the Federation of German Industries, uh, and the DIHK, which is the Association of German uh, Chambers of Industry, of Commerce and Industry. Uh, we've been active in Washington for over 30 years. And just to give you a short I idea of the footprint of German business in the U.S., there are over 5,600 uh, German companies in the U.S., which account uh, together for uh, $564 billion in investment and 860,000 jobs. And we're thrilled today to welcome today's uh, distinguished panel uh, from German political foundations in Washington, as well as from the, the BDI in Berlin. I just have a couple of uh, housekeeping notes uh, before we start. Uh, please turn off your cameras and mute your microphones if you're not one of the speakers or uh, asking a question. Uh, during the Q&A section, you're more than welcome to use the raise hand function uh, and Peter, our moderator, uh, will call on you to ask a question or uh, you can submit questions uh, through the chat, which Peter will then uh, curate. Uh, and we are planning to record today's uh, session. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about that, please feel free to contact me directly. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Peter Rashish, who's a senior fellow and director of the Geoeconomics Program at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Thanks, Jay. Um, good to be here with you. Thanks to um, RGIT. Um, let me add my welcome to all of you for joining us. I'm looking forward to moderating the panel. Uh, last month's <clears throat> German elections have... Um, <laughs> Everything. Okay. Everything. Last month's German elections have uh, reinforced uh, the notion that the German political landscape is becoming more diverse, with six parties now vying for votes, and for the first time in more than six decades, a likely coalition of three parties. What this means for German economic policies, for the domestic and the EU economy, for international trade and investment, technology and climate also, but and in addition for the transatlantic economic relationship is the focus of our discussion today. And to help us understand where a German economic policy and the German economy are, are, are headed, uh, we're lucky to have uh, with us today the heads of the Washington offices of four so German four political organizations, as Jay mentioned, as well as um, a senior representative from uh, the Federation of German Industries, BDI. Um, so let me introduce the speakers. Uh, they will each uh, offer about five minutes of introductory remarks, and then I'll moderate a discussion um, uh, among among them and then please do uh, let us know if you have any questions and then I will I will take them and pose them to the speakers. Um, first, Knut Depp Lipson has served as a representative to the United States and Canada of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation since 2018. Prior to coming to Washington, he led the uh, FVS offices in Warsaw, Jerusalem and Shanghai. And in between, he also served as the department head of the Asia and Pacific Department of FVS in Berlin. Knut has extensive experience in the United States, including a year-long high school exchange program in Logan, West Virginia, and later working for Senator Dianne Feinstein as a legislative fellow in advising her on foreign affairs issues. Christian Forsena has been the director of the Washington Office of the Heinz Seidel Foundation since 2016. Before coming to DC, he led uh, Heinz Seidel offices in Brussels and Moscow, and uh, as well as the European Commission Technical Assistance Project in Moscow. And he's also worked as an election observer for the OSCE in Ukraine and Russia. Christian has published numerous articles on EU affairs and security policies, Russian and US politics. Klaus Gomko is head of the regional office of North America for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, a position he's held since 2005. He's also president uh, of his own company, Hanseatic Institute, Inc., a consulting and public affairs firm. Prior to his current position, Klaus was program director for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation's Transatlantic Dialogue Program, and he also received the German Marshall Fund Congressional Fellowship of the American Political Science Association and worked as a legislator in, in the U.S. House of Representatives for three years. Bastian Hermesen has been executive director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's Washington office since 2015. Earlier, he directed the Böll Foundation's European office in Brussels and was head of the EU North America department, as well as the Department for Foreign and Security Policy of the Böll Foundation's headquarters in Berlin. 
Previously, he directed the program for transatlantic relations at the foundation's office in Washington. And before joining Bode, he served for three years as an advisor on foreign security and environmental policies to a member of parliament, Katrin göring eckardt who was caucus leader of the Greens in the Bundestag. And finally, Matthias Kramer has been head of the External Economic Policy Department at the Federation of German Industries, or BDI, since January of this year. He's worked for BDI for over 10 years, and in that time has led multiple departments, including strategic planning and coordination, mobility and logistics, and small and family-run businesses and uh, membership development. So with that, uh, let me uh, turn the floor over to uh, Knut, uh, who will start things off. We'll hear from the rest of the speakers and then we'll move to a discussion. Over to you, Knut. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for having us today. Obviously, as a social democrat, one feels a certain esprit right now. And, and, and we are, of course, excited about the election victory that the SPD under the leadership of Olaf Scholz was able to deliver and that the SPD gained over two million votes, which is substantial. But it's also, I think, if you look at it from a bigger picture, it's a really a, a, a tidal change that is happening right now in German, but also in European politics. And it, it I would think also that what is happening now has already started, as a matter of fact, earlier, probably already two or three years ago, and particularly when you look at the economic uh, policy debate, the fiscal policy debate, uh, and also if you look at what Olaf Scholz, who was, I think, instrumental for the success of the Social Democrats, has spoken about in the last two years when he spoke about financial and economic policy. What do I mean with that? I mean, I think there is a shift in economic policy away from austerity, but to see that this is absolutely necessary to have huge public investments and also that you have to change the way um, economic policy is done in the European level, on the European level, that there needs to be more solidarity, that it was a mistake <clears throat> to treat Greek, the southern states, the way it was done under Schäuble and Merkel. And it was something actually that the old chancellor Helmut Schmidt said at his big last uh, big speech at an SPD conference, a party conference in 2011. And now there is need, of course, to reform, reform. The, the, reform the way that works on the European level. And th those are things that will need to be done uh, probably under a chancellor uh, elected by the three fractions, the SPD, SPD uh, FDP and the Greens. But I would also like to mention that in a way, at least from a social democratic standpoint, we were already in a three party coalition when we were the junior partner of the CDU and CSU who are two parties and we always felt that they are two different parties. So in a way, I personally can only say I feel very optimistic about uh, the negotiations between the three parties. And um, obviously we cannot speak really about that because one good thing is that these are really closed negotiations. I think that is very good for the negotiations. But what you have seen, <clears throat> there is a first paper came out of the um, negotiations, the so-called Sondierungspapier. And if you read it, you will find some of what I've just said uh, in that from a social democratic standpoint, of course, very important. And I think also one reason of the victory is that the social democratic party ran on a progressive but realistic platform and made certain promises, which you will also find in the Sondierungspapier, which is that there will be a 12 euro minimum wage, I think, which helped a lot. Uh, in winning over those that were, had doubts if the SPD is really a social justice party. But uh, as important is also the promise to build 400,000 flats a year and 100,000 of them um, with a special uh, um, status or to, that for them being for, available for families with low incomes. And um, also to be clearly pro-European 
and slash also pro, of course, transatlantic. Yeah. And if you have read the article that I mean, I can remind you of an article maybe that one can revisit. Olaf Scholz wrote an article in the German weekly, the Spiegel, after Joe Biden was elected and expressed the promise, uh, the, the hope that uh, with a new president, it would be possible to have a new trial to negotiate a tree, trade agreement between the United States and the EU and but a trade agreement that would work for the people and that would already in an early stage include important stakeholders like trade unions uh, and um, and uh, and other groups that have interest in these so that social standards economic and uh, environmental standards are met in the tra in these trade negotiations and i personally think that would be something very important to try i know it's probably fairly difficult um, because it, it seems to me that the Biden administration does not really have a trade policy, but uh, we will see how that goes. I'll leave it there. These are like a few ideas that I wanted to share with you. Thanks, Knut. Christian, over to you. Okay, perfect. Now, uh, thanks, Peter, and thanks, uh, Matthias, uh, Jay, uh, BDI, for uh, having us there for this uh, discussion. Yeah. So from a um, CSU conservative uh, perspective, there are a couple of general comments at the beginning. Um, first, I do want to start and congratulate uh, uh, the election winners. Yeah, so there, uh, Knut has said there, uh, the SPD uh, won seats, uh, uh, the Liberals, uh, Klaus, uh, congratulations to the FDP and to the Greens, Bastian. Yeah, so uh, congratulations uh, to the election winners. Yeah, the. Um, coalition talks, yeah, Knut has said there, there's a sondierung, there pre, pre uh, coalition paper uh, published there yeah, uh, last week. Yeah. It clearly indicates that there's a strong will for the election winners yeah, to forge a coalition, uh, which most likely will be in place uh, around Christmas, before Christmas. Yeah, so, the new, so the New Year's speech yeah, will be given by the new chancellor, yeah, which is more than symbolic. Yeah, and it will be a coalition of the election winners. So representing the wish of the voters yeah so congratulations yeah general trends yeah what has been reinforced yeah, with the uh, uh, last elections yeah you briefly touched upon it yeah peter when you said it's more diverse so the pluralization of in society leads to a more diverse political landscape the catch-all parties yeah, spd cdu which uh, uh, years decades ago yeah uh, uh, Attracted around 30, 40 percent yeah, of, of, of voters. Yeah, they are now down to 20, 25 percent. Yeah, other parties emerge. Yeah, so the center is more diverse. Yeah, second, but the center still holds. Yeah, we don't see increases. Yeah, in the fringe parties. Yeah, the right, the far right, the far left. Yeah, has not emerged stronger. So the center still holds. Um, if the center, yeah, is more diverse, yeah, individual factors yeah, like personality matter more so the attractiveness of a spitzenkandidat yeah, is more important there yeah, than the election platform or any ideology and last point of um, politics matters yeah? so we have an increased voter turnout yeah? which is still a good so democracy in germany works and the uh, election and the election results are accepted yeah so uh, there's no um, uh, contested yeah, election uh, result, yeah. And final point, of course, uh, the campaign has shown, yeah, it's it's a, a political culture of a compromise, yeah, because everyone knows yeah, that you have to work together after the elections, yeah, and you treat your opponent uh, with respect. So this is all general trends, yeah, which have, uh, and and maybe a last point yeah, as, a, as a general trend, yeah. So party allegiance uh, is reduced, swing voters yeah, are more and more common, and the swing voter cast uh, the vote yeah, at the very last moment, yeah, which makes um, polling yeah, and forecasting yeah, so uh, difficult. Yeah. So party allegiance is, 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 is reduced. Yeah. Now, maybe briefly, uh, why did the CDU lose? What are the major reasons uh, for the election losses? Yeah? First point, Angela Merkel, yeah, she is still the most popular politician, but her popularity did not translate, yeah, did not expand yeah, to the successor. 
to the Spitzenkandidat. Yeah. Angela Merkel was, was still the chancellor. She stepped down as party leader. The new party leader, Armin Laschet, had a difficult task here to really get out of the shade of, of, of Angela Merkel. Yeah. Uh, second, he definitely committed individual mistakes, but he was faced uh, with a very negative uh, media coverage. Third point, yeah, the internal, we all know, yeah, competition. So the CDU Spitzenkandidat was challenged there yeah, by the CSU party leader, Markus Söder, which has not definitely yeah, um, resulted yeah, in better polling numbers yeah, for the CDU Spitzenkandidat. Yeah. And finally, finally, the economic situation, yeah, which is in general pretty good in Germany, yeah, high employment, yeah, and Germany uh, is, is in, 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 a, in, a, in a robust uh, economic situation, yeah, despite all COVID challenges, yeah, but this economic uh, uh, satisfying situation, yeah, was not benefiting, yeah, uh, the CDU, the, the ruling party, yeah, but many took it, yeah, as something, okay, we accept it, we see it, yeah, it's a good economic situation, yeah? that's why we focus on other political topics, yeah, like climate change, yeah, social inclusiveness, yeah, which are the main topics of other political parties. Yeah? So the satisfying politi uh, economic situation yeah, was not beneficial yeah, to the CDU, to the ruling party. And now a couple, really a couple of uh, um, the impact yeah, and uh, I do want to directly respond yeah, to, to what Knut has said. Yeah? Um, um, there are constitutional constraints at European level and at national level yeah, in a more like defense spending policy. Yeah? We have the Maastricht criteria, we have the growth and stability pact, and all these are the main constraints yeah? and upheld by the German Constitutional Court. We do have a no bailout clause yeah, in European treaties. Yeah? That's why the CDU and the CSU always wanted to balance yeah? solidarity and fiscal um, restrictions. Yeah? And there I see maybe yeah, a change, what you called, yeah, what Knut has called a tidal change in European deficit spending. Yeah. I would say the CDU stood up for, for the constitutional, for rule of law, for the constitutional constraints. And um, there, is, there is some concern that this balance yeah, might, not, might not be upheld yeah, uh, in, 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 in future policies. Yeah. Trade agreements, yeah, I have doubts that a left-leaning government in Germany is um, eager and ready to conclude trade agreements. Uh, even yeah, the CETA agreement yeah, has met with a huge, a huge level, a huge amount of rejection yeah, by a left-leaning, by the left-leaning political parties. Yeah. So, uh, not to say and not to speak about any future agreements. Yeah. And finally, defense spending, yeah, which is also a big issue yeah, here in transatlantic affairs. I don't see any major breakthroughs and defense spending yeah, with the new, new left-leaning German government. Yeah. So there will be, and there are critical issues uh, remaining in transatlantic affairs. Uh, so, and, and I see the CDU and the, um, the weakening of the CDU and the CSU as um, um, uh, maybe yeah, um, 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 a missing voice of rationality and a, sober, a missing sober voice in German politics. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Um, Klaus, how do you see things? Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, convening us. Uh, it's a little bit of a tradition uh, that the uh, foundation representatives in Washington sit down after the federal election to talk about them. Uh, from the FDP perspective, as you can imagine, this was a very successful election. Uh, also for us an historic election, because this is the second time in history uh, that the uh, FDP got double digit uh, in the uh, federal elections. Never happened before. Uh, so this is for us uh, was a good uh, evening. Why? Um, that's a very good question. And it, it ties into your issues. First of all, uh, it was made clear by the leadership of the FDP uh, that they would campaign on issues. Uh, what, were, what were the issues? Uh, first of all, uh, digitalization uh, was a huge issue. A digitalization not only in society and economy, but also bureaucracies, modernized bureaucracies. Second was education. 
uh, uh, modernize the, the education system and, and uh, have more chances for people uh, that are normally not well off uh, to get a better start. Uh, second of all, uh, third point, um, I think there uh, was, we were one of the few parties uh, that uh, supported the startup uh, industries which is still uh, under supported in the political field. And, and I think that had uh, uh, impact uh, for uh, our running on these issues. And the last one, if, of course, the big issue, and, and you also see this in, in, the, in the paper, is of course climate change. Um, and uh, we knew from the very beginning, it's, this issue is owned by the Greens, so it, it doesn't make sense for us to campaign on it, but. I think our approach uh, to climate change uh, uh, was to fight climate change with innovation, not necessarily with restrictions, but innovation. And I think there was a large part of the electorate who uh, uh, liked that um, a, a lot. Uh, I thought also historically interesting was that um, uh, the FTP's uh, proportion of younger voters was I think the first time higher uh, than the traditional uh, uh, party, specifically the Greens, which were were of course not make them not happy. So all of this was uh, uh, very good uh, in terms of the election result. And also, when you look at all these issues, I, I think COVID and the pandemic and the crisis of the pandemic had put those issues on the forefront. You know, all of a sudden we are all sitting at home and realize that we don't have good internet access. Uh, and, and I mean, I could go on uh, education that the schools were not prepared for this and so on. So we are kind of a beneficiary when you look at the numbers before COVID and then after COVID, uh, we've been uh, uh, a beneficiary of, um, of this pandemic in the political terms. Last point I want to make uh, uh, is that what it also has shown uh, that, in, and this is an old rule in German politics, parties that have infighting during campaigns lose. When you look at the three parties that lost proportions of their vote, the CDU, CSU, the AFD and the left, all of them get huge infighting and the German voter doesn't like it. And that's why I think what the SPD did was tremendous to basically uh, unite behind uh, uh, Olaf Scholz and, and have this picture of a united party. Uh, for the Greens and I think us, it was quite clear that the only way uh, to get where we're at right now is we had to be stick together as parties. So that's my uh, short uh, uh, introduction into how I see this election from from the FTP perspective. Thanks, Klaus. Bastian, what's your view? Thank you very much, Peter, and, uh, and thanks for the invitation. It's great to see you all. Um, I, I want to start out by reiterating um, something that, that Christian also mentioned that I think beyond party lines, this election is good news for democracy itself and the stability of democracy in Germany. Um, the, the fact that almost 90% of voters voted for parties from the democratic spectrum and that the only anti-democratic party in Germany lost votes, I think is, is really good news for anyone that thinks about the stability of our political system. It shows the ability to compromise that, that Christian also uh, emphasized. And I think it's even more important because this is not just about the Bundestag. Um, it is also about the second chamber, the Bundesrat, where the CDU CSU will continue to play an important role and where the left party is also co-governing in, in uh, three of the German states. So this ability to compromise among the democratic spectrum um, is, is really important and um, and uh, and I think I think the election shows that there is a, is a good chance that that will work. From a green perspective, um, as you all know, this this uh, election result was a record result for the Green Party. They increased their vote share by more than 50 percent. Um, very importantly, they also gained 16 direct mandates, which shows really a much wider appeal. 
and they gained voters, which was very important for the party in the countryside as well as the urban centers. Um, and this has been really a long, a long road that they have traveled. Um, at the same time, the bid for the chancery that they for the first time uh, put out this year um, clearly failed. Um, and I think it shows that it was a stretch um, probably to advocate for large scale political change that they would lead at a time when they had not been in federal government for 16 years. Um, and so it's really important, I think, for the party to uh, enter government at this point and go from there and demonstrate that they can um, have the ability to govern responsibly on the federal level as well, gain more trust and then uh, take the next step a few years from now. I think what's really important when we look at the potential next coalition, though, is if every party in it will just try to get whatever they want for their own constituency or whether this coalition can be more than the sum of its parts. I think that is a lesson from the failed Jamaican negotiations four years ago um, as well. The question, what will a new government have as a common modernization project? And I think from what we hear up to now from the negotiations, SPD, FDP and Greens are on a good path in that, in that they are trying to come up with a common transformation agenda. And we've heard some of the core parts of that agenda. It's about digitalization. It's about a proactive climate policy. It's about modern society as well. What does it mean to have a diverse and pluralistic modern society? And it is about some, to some extent, some changes in foreign policy as well about Germany's place in the world. And, and I think that is what is called for right now. It's really the question of the competitiveness of the German economic and political model under very different technological and political global circumstances um, along those lines. But I also wanna end by saying, uh, this is not going to be easy, right? Like right now, um, it's about creating a proactive agenda. But I think this government, when it does come to pass, um, will immediately be facing a number of large crises as well that you then have to deal with. We have a European energy crisis right now. Vladimir Putin is already testing this next German government. We have a global supply chain. Um, well, crisis or at least challenges where, where the question is, what does this mean for the for the German economic model? So I think the next government, um, despite what it plans to do, will have its work cut out for them. Thank you. Thank you, Bastian. And now uh, to Matthias uh, for yes. your perspective from the BDI. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for the invitation and for having me this morning, this afternoon. Well, first of all, I would like to give you some uh, ideas and some of our views uh, on the on that what happened in the last days and maybe will happen in the next weeks. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that for us, it's the content that counts at the end of the day, not the colors um, of any party. So we are quite curious to see what lines of consensus will emerge at the end of the day from all the talks. and. Um, well, I think we have certain expectations for the negotiations for the next uh, government, for the next coalition. I think, first of all, um, and if you also talk to um, our members and businessmen and the business community, um, there should be a maximum of responsibility instead of tactical maneuvers. Maybe everybody is a bit fed up of election campaigning and playing political games. So now, please. Uh, let's get serious and get back to work. Um, and for us, of course, not astonishing for you, uh, the guiding principle should be a successful German industry in Europe and the world. And we also think that um, with regard to the negotiations, quality should be uh, um, should be taken into account uh, before speed in the coalition negotiations. So please take your times. Uh, so that at the end of the day, uh, there is a stable government or a stable fundament for a government because uh, this means uh, kind of a planning security for our business members that um, if they are sure that there is a stable government for them, it's easier to plan and to make some forecasts and foresights for the uh, closer future. And at the end of the day of the negotiations, there should be concrete measures. Um, on the table to tackle the challenges. It was already mentioned for climate protection, the digital transformation and, and also some geopolitical crisis, I think. So what is our, in, in, in a few words, what, what are our priorities or our, what counts now for the next government from our point of view? 
Well, I think we need a comprehensive growth program that makes Germany still an attractive business locations also for companies from abroad. I know this is something that um, people from federations uh, don't stop uh, telling you, but uh, I think it's even in these days, it's worth to repeat it again. We need structural reforms to overcome the stagnation of the last government in areas of digitalization and energy and climate policy, I think. We see a need for massive investments in infrastructure and education as well. Another truism is uh, less bureaucracy. I know uh, it's uh, it's said by the BDI since maybe the uh, since BDI exists, but I think the pandemic has shown very hardly for us that our administration and our um, and, and, and our local administration, communal administration is not in the best shape. And I think really we need a program of modernization. As a volunteer who took part in the election day in Berlin, I can tell you that there is a need, uh, a high need for a reform in that area. And the key principle um, should always be for a new government, the international competition, we are still under competition. It should not be forgotten. We talk, a, we talk a lot about subsidies. We talk a lot about programs in order to foster innovation, growth and uh, solutions for climate policy. But we should not forget market mechanisms and we should see that uh, our members, uh, they are under a heavy international competition. And um, of course, there should always be uh, uh, an openness to different technological solutions with regard to all the questions I have mentioned. So if we look at the last days, it was already mentioned the 12 pages paper of the Sondierungsgespräche. For us, there is some light in it, but there are also still some question marks. Um, and so we have to see and uh, we will um, uh, we will um, really um, look on it very closely in the next weeks. We will see on the details. I mean, of course, it's right uh, that there will be no new taxes on assets and no tax increases. There you can already see the influence of the FDP, of the Liberal Party. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we miss a clear statement. For example, if we would like to go into a detail. Um, uh, we miss a clear statement on the expansion of loss carrybacks from the Corona pandemic period. Uh, on the other hand, it's right that the parties have emphasized they would like to strengthen an economic stimulus through a, they call it super depreciations for investments in climate protection and digitalization. But at the end of the day, um, the financing of public spending remains unclear because the budgetary uh, margins in this period, in this next legislative period, are extremely narrow. So we also expect the political actors to reach a swift understanding on possible sources of funding. So this is another question mark I was um, uh, I was talking about. So, but um, finally, if we look at uh, the whole area of trade policy, and foreign policy, I think uh, there are only two sentences uh, in this 12 pages paper. Um, there is a, I mean, everybody is uh, for free trade under fair and uh, good uh, conditions. I think um, it is also for uh, from our point of view, it's, it's a good point. But at the end of the day, also in this area, we have to go much more into the details. So um, we are quite curious on all these details. So. To sum it up, first lights, some question marks, and now I'm happy to discuss these points with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, let me start things off by noting that the uh, the Sondierungspapier, the, the paper that the three uh, parties produced as they're uh, having their uh, negotiations towards a coalition, uses the phrase, I think it's the first time, at least first time I've seen it, social ecological market economy. Now, maybe that's to be expected given the likely makeup of the next uh, government, but since it is something uh, new or at least newish, I wondered if I could ask each of you, um, uh, perhaps I could ask each of, I could ask Bastian, Klaus, and Knut what you think that means, and then perhaps ask um, Christian and Matthias to comment on that. 
Um, Knut, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start, uh, but I mean, obviously, I'm again. I want to stress, I am not close to the, the the talks that are happening in Berlin, and it's also not the reason why I'm here. So, and the, I, I would not. I mean, this paper is of course interesting, but uh, the the coalition treaty will be much longer, much more detailed. There will be many negotiation teams. Um, that will negotiate the details, but then also the uh, treaty is, of course, a treaty and not then the executive program. I mean, that then the details will really happen when the government comes into action. I mean, that's what that is for. I mean, so, um, but I mean, what does it mean? I mean, it is, it's going to, what I meant with title change is not necessarily, um, the quiet revolution of German economics that uh, Olaf Scholz did. It is more what I expect from this decade. This decade is going to be an extremely difficult decade because we have shifts in the world. We have we are going to have many crises and, and that's the tidal change. I mean, and and, the, and Europe has to react to that. Germany has to react to that. And I think part of the reason people feel that something is coming and then they wanted leadership that they think will guide them through this time and would want a, wanted a government which can make Germany ready for the future and which I think can happen with this coalition, which stresses, of course, the needs to fight the climate crisis. And the big question is, how do you get Germany in 20 years or in 24 years to be carbon neutral? That is extremely difficult and at the same time competitive. And it's, of course, easy to talk about it, but it's uh, very difficult to do. I mean, and like, so how will you supply the necessary electricity uh, at a price that is that is necessary? And so it is basically this term to me is to balance um, the need to find uh, climate, the climate crisis to change Germany internally, um, to change uh, mobility um, and to also change, of course, the way um, we, we run our industry, but at the same time keep the industries because they are the backbone of, of the German success. And this is what this term tries to um, interpret. And then, of course, there is also something that is uh, important for the German society that you um, deal with the uh, social inequalities. So that's why that term is needs, is also in that um, paper. And as I mentioned, it is, I think, not only for social, but also for economic reasons, very important to have the minimum wage raised and to um, make sure that the pension systems are at the level as they are. And uh, so that's, this term tries to balance the different aspects um, that need to be done in the future. Bastian, how do you see the uh, meaning of this idea? So, I mean, I think um, the the term social market economy, right? Not just the market economy, but a social market economy is really the original uh, economic model um, and political model of the Federal Republic of Germany. And this term that you need to enhance it to be a social ecological market economy has been a concept that has been around for quite some time, but indeed not been embraced as a leading concept by a federal government. So that would be something new. But the thought is very simple, is that we are a market economy um, that accepts that we need certain guardrails. Um, we need guardrails in social uh, re respects um, because social cohesion is something that is you know, part of our basic law in Germany as a goal of, of German politics and any government. We also need environmental guardrails um, to, you know, to protect the very basis of our of our subsistence. Um, and I think, therefore, th th this term does encompass um, if if these three parties manage to successfully come up with a with a common program. Again, the competitiveness of the German economic and political model um, under today's circumstances. It is not just about economic competition. We are living in an age of also political competition with alternative systems of, of governance. And we have to prove 
that we can succeed in those circumstances. And that depends on, as we've talked about digitalization, it depends on climate neutral technologies and production. It also depends though on strengthening democracy at home and on a clear position with regard to Germany's and Europe's role in the world. So it's not just a term for our domestic um, circumstances, it's also a term for how we position ourselves politically in Europe and in the world. Klaus, how do you see it? Uh, I don't really have to add a lot to what Bastian said. I completely agree. Um, I, I think what this word means is the framework uh, in which this coalition will uh, negotiate and, and will also make decisions. Um, and it's, uh, it very much represents all three parties. Uh, on the heart of the FDP, of course, was always the market economy more uh, uh, than social or ecological. So I think this is a, a, it's a symbolically very important term. And it also modernized the old social market economy term. Uh, um, and I think that's very important because I think one of the things that this uh, paper shows is that, and that's why people voted for these three parties and, and German voters very much also vote, which is very strange for Americans, uh, uh, to look at what coalition is possible. And, and I think uh, they voted for the, these three parties to build a coalition because they know uh, uh, the social market economy has to be modernized. And I think that's, I think the term one way or the other that this coalition will be historically judged at is this term. And I think it's, 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 yes, it is just a phrase and it just, it is maybe symbolic, but I think in terms of the thinking of <laughs> the different negotiation partners, I think it's more important than uh, uh, it just says on paper. Christian, any comment on that or any what was said before? No, thanks. Thanks, Peter. I think um, an ecological social market economy, yeah, that's a, a concept yeah, embraced by the CDU and CSU as well. Yeah, So it's a continuation of what you have, a core principle, principle yeah, a market economy which has been transformed into a social market economy, this Rhineland model of German, Germany's social market economy. And today, yeah, with the importance of climate change and climate protection, yeah, it's a continuation. Yeah, and you just continue to write a chapter in this market economy, social market economy, yeah, ecological social market economy. Yeah. If, and now we come in there as the CDU, CSU, if this new concept yeah, is still focused on the competitiveness of the German industry on economic growth, because we need a substantial base and economy, yeah, which is the substance, yeah, um, which um, provides a situation, yeah, where we where we can afford to do other things, yeah. But you need an economic substance and economic growth, yeah. We um, welcome, yeah, um, 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 an acceleration of uh, phasing out uh, uh, coal, uh, the usage of coal. Um, a focus on emission trading system, yeah, it is a core element, yeah, to say we need more international uh, um, um, agreements, yeah, alignment, yeah, commitment, yeah, in climate protection, yeah, less national path, yeah, more international agreements, yeah, so the focus on a European Fit for 55 program, yeah, uh, emission trading system, yeah, welcome, yeah, but, and this is yeah, our, our wish list, yeah, uh, focus or bear in mind your yeah, competitiveness of the German economy yeah, and affordability. Yeah, so energy is already today highly, highly priced. Yeah, so energy has to be affordable uh, to the people. Yeah, and uh, certainly uh, uh, for the industry yeah, to remain competitive. Yeah, but in general, yeah, Peter, a, a ecological social market economy. Yeah, that's a concept. Yeah, which is broadly welcomed. Yeah, and very well received. Matthias, any thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you. I just before I give you some thoughts on the um, social market economy, uh, I just wanted to add what Bastian said uh, because you were talking. It's not only about competition. I fully agree, and uh, we fully support the commitment to a responsible European and value-based foreign policy, especially in the system competition with authoritarian states, which was mentioned also in the Sondierungspapier. So. 
Uh, I think there we are fully in line with you. No, but if I uh, talk talk about uh, social market economy, I mean, I think this concept we all knew ha has been so successful within the last decades, and it was the perfect um, the perfect system for German industry to develop itself, to foster innovation, to foster growth. And if you call it at the end of the day like a social eco ecologic uh, market system, we are fine with it. But at the end of the day, we really have to be careful that the market system uh, in this expression uh, is really the outstanding mechanism uh, in order to, to organize this transformation of the industry. That's what Knut said. I mean, it's the base and it's very good that all parties uh, agree that Germany must remain a successful industry and industrial nation. So the industry is the base of all wealth and 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 and, and everything that we have in this country. But but at, at the end of the day, we really must not uh, forget market mechanisms in order to organize this transformation because this transformation must be organized by industry itself. So politics can give some guidelines, they can give some incentives, but at the end of the day, it must be done by the companies itself. And the companies now really need a stable vision, a stable perspective. How will be this transformation uh, organized? What are the guiding principles? And if we have it, then please let them run and please let them go. And and it's not only uh, um, all about um, spending money or giving subsidies. For example, um, we need, for example, faster approval and planning processes in this country. If we want to organize a new infrastructure to bring renewable energy from offshore wind parks from the um, Baltic or Northern Sea to the south of Germany, we need a new um, infrastructure and we have enormous problems building up those um, uh, power lines. We have enormous complaints of many, many citizens and we have to handle this and we need decisions on that. Um, Olaf Scholz, he always uh, emphasized in his speeches and that was a right point. If the chemical industry of Germany uh, um, um, will, be, will be able to produce carbon neutral in 2050, uh, their need only from the chemical industry um, for electricity or power will be as high as it is today for the whole of Germany. So we have to organize this energy supply for only one uh, sector. And um, I think uh, the, 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 the whole process is, is such a tremendous challenge and it's not only by spending money. OK, now I'll make a point here. Thank you. Um, since we're having this discussion uh, in Washington, I wanted to ask um, your views on how you see the uh, likely traffic light coalition playing out uh, for transatlantic relations and transatlantic economic relations, um, especially. Um, you know, one thing that has uh, happened recently is the launch of a trade and technology council between the US and the EU at the end of September in Pittsburgh. They're looking at issues like supply chains, climate technology, artificial intelligence, global trade rules. There, there are 10 working groups altogether. Um, do you think that this new coalition um, has a chance to enhance cooperation with the Biden administration? Uh, and even if you do, do you think there are some areas where there are, might be some uh, frictions that need to be managed? And who would like to um, offer some thoughts to start? I, uh, I won't pick on Knut first just because you, uh, I did that before, but um, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, Bastian, can I turn to you? Sure. Um, thank you, Peter. I mean, I think, um, I think the outgoing German government, um, in, this is my, my personal view, um, unfortunately, I think did not um, uh, take the outstretched hand of Joe Biden early on in his administration to the extent that uh, many political actors here in Washington would have wished and to really start a democracy and modernization alliance uh, across across the Atlantic. Um, that's partly just due to the fact that right they were more or less more or less on the on the way out. They had also just lived through 
the the trauma of of the Trump years and and the whole question mark of the future of transatlantic relations in that respect. So I think it is not only a possibility that the new Japanese government can do I don't want to call it a reset, but can start you know with 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 new energy to to define and tackle common transatlantic projects. But I think it is deeply necessary because some of the challenges we've talked about are common challenges and they are better dealt with together. I mean, I think of a climate alliance, of course, I think of a technology alliance and the question of how does that fool, I think of common approaches to, to fair trade uh, regimes and, and, and a fair level playing field on, on trade uh, globally, um, including on how we deal with, with China as a competitor. Um, and of a democracy alliance, of course, speaking of the, of the kind of you know, systemic competition that we are facing in today's world. So I think it's deeply necessary. I think the TTC could be one element of that, uh, not exclusively. Um, I think the Glasgow Climate Summit will be important as well. I think the Democracy Summit that is going to be hosted by the Biden administration on December 9th and 10th and leading to a full year process of how an alliance of democratic actors in the world could, could form will be important. So on lots of levels. I think it'll be crucial for the next government to uh, to get started. There is no time to waste. We all know the U.S. political calendar. The midterms are around the corner, and everyone's already thinking about 2024. I think I think Peter, um, it, it is systemic that in this paper um, that there are only two sentences about uh, a trade and foreign policy. Uh, I think. First and foremost, I think this government will concentrate uh, on Germany and Europe. Um, I think Europe will uh, will play a, a huge role. Uh, I, and also, I hope, uh, and this is what I'm preaching for for years now uh, in Berlin, is that in terms of transatlantic relations, the the question is not what does the Americans expect. Uh, the question should be what can we do? What can we offer? Uh, of course, Bastian is is right. Uh, you know, the Trump administration ha has uh, 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 you know shocked Europe uh, uh, over the four years, but still, it does not uh, 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 exclude them from from thinking about their own approach uh, towards transatlantic relations, uh, economic relations, but also China and Russia. Um, I think those are those are three very very big issues uh, uh, that, you know, will not go away. So I think, uh, and of course, and, and, and I completely agree uh, with uh, 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 with Bastian, also the uh, uh, debate on democracy is extremely important uh, uh, because, I mean, we all deal with this uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, trying to influence elections and so on. So I think that's, for me, a much more important issue is that the Europe, the Germans and the Europeans have to define what they want in those transatlantic relationships. So if maybe I can add there something um, because I think it's a good point that Klaus made. Uh, we have to define it. Um, German business um, is also ready to start a revival of the transatlantic relations. A couple of months ago, you might have known or you might have heard from it, um, BDI has founded a new transatlantic business initiative together with three other federations. And in these days, we are working very hard on, uh, on different issues, climate policy, trade policy, and so on, uh, in order to um, create new positions and content and papers uh, with which we would like to get in touch with the new German government and as well with the um, Biden administration, hopefully, uh, in the beginning of next year, we will be able to travel abroad and uh, get in touch with the, uh, some political representatives. So um, there was a certain mood in the German business community in summer that now we have a momentum and we have to use it. And uh, so let's build up a new initiative. Let's get in touch. Uh, let's bring our opinion. Uh, let's bring our positions to our friends in Canada as well and the United States and in order to discuss together with them. Uh, so hopefully we can make a little contribution to that what Klaus said. We have to define it, what we want in the transatlantic relations and hopefully German business uh, is, uh, will be prepared in the next weeks. 
Well, if I could, uh, uh, can you just want to Yeah, please. Yeah, just let me say, like, obviously, I think on the high political level, um, I, th I think in the bilateral relationship between Germany and the United States, the way uh, politics work in Washington, the chancellor is extremely important. Uh, Olaf Scholz is a very pro transatlantic uh, politician. Uh, as you know, he was in Washington last week. He was in Washington on the 1st of July, uh, um, specifically to also have political talks uh, uh, in Congress um, with senators and congressmen, and um, also with uh, his counterpart, Secretary Yellen. I think very important from uh, is, of course, uh, also what is the U.S. willing to grant and to uh, to work together with. And uh, there, I mean, I would say there's also um, room uh, for development. And uh, now there is a chance with the new German government uh, to get started and, and to really do something together. One point that I think is from a European point of view very important is of course multilateralism and multilateral agreements that's why we view it as a, a huge success that the us agreed to the, the minimum taxation um basically standard and is now pushing this forward an idea that olaf scholz has promoted for a very long time but i mean in general it's very difficult because under obama multilateralism was neglected uh, Trump had open disdain for it. And now the question is, is the Biden administration serious about reviving multilateral or is it more a tactical thing to uh, mainly for for strengthening um, in US hegemony? And so uh, I think there will be a lot of work to be done. And I mean, I already made one point that I, I personally believe would be important, that is trade. And uh, there it will be, I think, more difficult on the US side than on the European side. And uh, I agree with Klaus that this government, our uh, new government will have to focus on Europe, of course, because it is our future is Europe and we need to make Europe stronger. And there's a lot of work to be done there. Well, we're almost at the end, but I would uh, just on what you just said, and 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 you mentioned that Klaus also brought up Europe. I, it does seem to me that the Biden administration, um, you know, had, and I think we see that from the Trade and Technology Council, has certain expectations for its cooperation with the European Union, and probably also for the role that the next German government can play to, within the European Union to help move that agenda forward. So I think there is that that that. Um, that European agenda is also in a certain way um, a US um, German agenda. Um, well, with that, maybe I'll hand it back over to Jay to um, to uh, give us a send off. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you. thanks to all of our distinguished panelists. It was a great discussion today. Um, and uh, thank all of you for coming and, and taking part in the uh, event and uh, hope to see you at the next one. But uh, I, I'm sorry we got off to a little bit of a slow start today, but uh, feel free to reach out with any uh, follow up questions or anything. But uh, until next time. OK, thanks. Bye bye. Bye.